from selling beats to selling books, if, if you've done any research on entrepreneurship in the 21st century, then you know chances are you've come across this idea of passive income, which is money that comes your way without your constant attention. I mean, it sounds like a really sweet deal. I mean, you make a thing once and then you get paid for it until what, the end of time. But what if I told you that passive income really isn't passive at all? especially in the production music world? And what if I told you that you're fooling yourself? If you think you could just crank out some cues and then rake in the royalties while what, sipping mimosas in your PJs without ever having to lift another finger? So we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna take a look at passive versus active income and discuss why I think that the passive income sales pitch doesn't really tell the whole story. Plus, we're going to feature the winning cue from our inaugural 52 Cues production derby, which features sounds all sampled from items found in the kitchen on this week's episode of the 52 Cues podcast. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Cues podcast, a weekly podcast dedicated to all things production and library music, where we talk about industry topics and take deep dives into the different aspects of being a working production music composer. Plus, we feature a cue written by you, a member of the 52 Cues community, and this week, uh, we'll be taking a listen to 25th Hour by Scott McLaughlin, and Scott's actually joining me on the podcast today because his cue was the winning submission of our first ever 52 cues production derby uh, which is a cue a tension cue featuring sounds sampled from the kitchen so really excited to have him on the podcast he's going to talk about his process talk talk about the sounds he used and how how he manipulated those sounds for a very very good tension cue. So you definitely want to stick around for that. But if you want to skip over the topic and get right to that cue critique, then uh, be sure to check out the timestamps in the description below. But before we get started, I have to give a special word of thanks to the family, friends, and patrons of 52 Cues who help keep the podcast, the channel, and everything here going. We are 100% community supported, so if you like what I do here, don't thank me, thank them. And if you want to learn more about how you can help support 52 Qs and unlock extra perks like live streams, workshops, uh, feedback sessions, lesson discounts, and much more, then be sure to click on the links in the description or stick around because we're going to be talking about that a little bit later in today's episode. So I want to talk about this idea of passive income. Because, like I said in the intro, you know, if you've poked around on the internet and you've looked for, you know, like ways to make money, ways ways to make uh, to make uh, a living uh, in music, in as online in the 21st century, then this concept of passive income kind of com- comes up qu- quite a bit, and I've seen it from everyone from you know, write your own nonfiction book or sell beats online or, or sell, sell music in game marketplaces or, or, you know, thinking that royalty income is considered passive income. So, so let's first define what, what most people think when they think of passive income, which is this idea that you make a thing, it could be a book, it could be some beats, it could be game samples, whatever, midi packs, and you put them up into a marketplace. And the marketplace then will generate income for you. And so you sell the thing, you put it out there, and every time somebody buys it, um, subscribes to it or whatever, then you continue to get passive income. And that's what I think most people think when they think of passive income. And as an educator, I see this a lot with the idea of selling courses. You do all this work, you create a course, and then you put it out there and it generates this back-end passive income. And I've read books, like read books like The 4-Hour Workweek and these types of ideas where (laughs) you, you put it out there and then you literally just wait for the money to show up. And I don't think, I don't think that's really how it goes. And I, I think that it's not really telling the whole story. And dare I say, we're getting dangerously close to snake oil 
In fact, most of most of the people that I see, especially like in in like writing nonfiction books or, or whatever, most of the people that I see touting passive income, they're making their income passive income by selling books and systems on generating passive income. That that's how they're making their living. You know, you can't necessarily call yourself a best-selling author if the only books you're selling are books about becoming an author. I mean, I don't get me wrong, that's that's that is that is justified and I and I'm not downplaying that. But it's hard to say, hey, I'm a successful author, and here's how I did it, and then write a book. If, if your only books are books on how to write books, then yes, you're, you're, you're a nonfiction author, but you're not really write, writing other nonfiction. It, it, it's like the snake eating its own tail kind of thing. Does that make sense? And so in the production music world, you know, I've seen courses and books and and YouTube channels all about selling beats and and, and or or selling your cues or or learn how to be a production music composer and all that. And they're all great. They're all great. But the idea that you can just batch a bunch of cues together, push them out there, and then relax, I think is 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 very misguided. I think it's I think it's very misguided because that's not actually how it works. And and and, and which which then now we have to define active income. Okay, on the surface level, active income is something is income that you generate from doing something and you only do it once and then you get you get income once. That's that's active income, I guess, the definition. Maybe I should have looked up a, a Webster's. <laughs> Webster defines active. De- but that's that's my concept of it. It's my understanding. When I do a lesson in real time, that is active income. I'm there. It's occupying an hour of my time. And I get paid for that hour. They get the lesson. I give them a little video so they have something, you know, to, to remember me by. And uh, the deal is done. End of transaction. Now, I could create a series of lessons and put those out there and put them up on, on the 52Qs website or something, and then people subscribe to it, and that gets us into passive income. But I'm here to say that, again, I don't think that's the whole story. So let's look at, at, at courses. And, and, and the lessons. One of the things that 52Qs is, is all about is creating interactive relationships. So the educational model isn't, here are a bunch of courses that you subscribe to and I just rake in the money. It's very much uh, an active, interactive type of community and all of the educational resources that I provide, they're not courses. Don't come to 52Qs if you're looking for courses. Instead, it's interactive uh, feedback, interactive uh, lessons and all of that through Zoom or YouTube live streams. And and this isn't a commercial for 52 Qs, just uh, helping kind of put some parameters on that. But even if I did have a course, then I would still want to have an active role in supporting that course. I would look to support those students taking that course. I would <clears throat> I would participate in discussions. I would be on the forums. You know, I would be answering questions. And, and most of the time when I answer questions, I'll, I shoot little videos just like this. Hey, you had a question. It's much easier for me to make a video than it is for me to like wall of text type you back. So it's a win-win. Students feel like it's an interactive experience and I don't have to sit there and bang my head on a keyboard. But that is active participation, to which that course isn't necessarily passive income anymore, because I am actively working with it. And the same is absolutely true with your cues. You're working with them. You're you're submitting cues to the libraries. You're writing cues. There's this interactivity back and forth. 
And guess what? Those libraries are going to want more. The, the production music world is insatiable. These libraries have a burning hunger that needs constant feeding. And so, no, you can't just write a batch of cues, send them on their merry way, and then crank out or, or, or rake in the royalties. Not only because uh, trends change. I mean, trailer trailer folks, they know this. Trailer trends change. So by the time you have an album of trailer music, then that might have a very short shelf life. Two, three, maybe four or five years. And if you're getting five years out of a cue, then you're doing really, really well. Especially cues in uh, modern styles like hip-hop cues, EDM cues. As soon as those trends shift, then guess what? You have to keep writing more. Trends change, styles change, tastes change. So you have to, you have to change with them, which means that it's actually pretty active. Your relationship with your libraries is very active, not to mention Libraries are always, always looking to pitch more music because music supervisors are always looking and wanting to use new music. Season two of a show is going to want new music. Now, it might pull some cues from previously, which is great, but they're always, always on the lookout for new music. I mentioned this before, I do a lot of work with CBS Sports, um, all of their major sports brands that they broadcast, the NFL, the PGA, NCAA tournament, the Big Three uh, tournament, the Masters tournament, PGA golf, all, basically any sports broadcasting that you would see on CBS, uh, I have music that is submitted into, into, those, uh, into those shows. Now, every year they want new music. And so a cue that got a ton of traction, a ton of rotation previously, is now out of rotation for whatever reason, for whatever reason. They just don't like it anymore, or chances are they have found something new, something fresh, which is, it's just new. And as much as music editors are creatures of habit, Right, this is works. If it if it's not broke, don't fix it. As much as they're they're creatures of habits, they're also also on the lookout constantly for something new, which means that our relationship with those libraries has to be active. You can't sit back and think that this is just passive income. You have to always be considering and looking to continue to feed the library, new music. So as soon as you start thinking, hey, this is passive, then, then you're in real trouble. You're in, you're in real trouble. Not to mention that passive isn't really passive at all. So let, let's, let's, let's talk about my very first season with the NFL. I wrote 17 cues. I was so excited. I was so hungry to get music on, on, on the NFL broadcasts that I wrote 17 cues. And of those 17, only five ever got picked up or all 17 got published. All 17 went up to the network, but only five ever saw air. And of those five, only two saw rotation, meaning they were showing up every single week. And of those two, only one saw rotation all the way through to the end of the season. And this is especially, you know, as I was learning how to, how to write these types of cues, I was learning about the industry and learning, you know, the difference between, you know, like tension music versus sports music. And, and so my publisher was super patient with me. But the hours and hours and hours that I spent on the front end like, I don't even want to think about how many hours. I'm sure I made less than minimum wage on those, on those cues. But the income that I made certainly wasn't 
passive. When I got my royalty statements, that income wasn't passive. I just front loaded all of the work. I did all the work on the front end without any upfronts, put it all out there. Five got air, two saw rotation, and only one kept getting into the rotation week after week to the end of the season. But I probably spent, I don't know, early, probably eight to 10 hours per queue. Now it's about four to six hours. Just the process is much more streamlined, and I know a lot more of what I'm doing. So I can't really consider all of those, those cues that made air as truly passive income because I did all this work on the front end. If anything, it's just it's deferred income. And so when, when I see somebody uh, talking about passive income from selling like game music or selling courses or selling books, you know, it's not passive income. It's deferred income. The hours and hours that goes in to making a good course, to making a good book. You're not getting paid for all those hours. You're hoping to recoup that money later. That's, that's the hope, at least. On top of creating uh, interactive, active experience while the thing is happening. So, is active versus passive income, is, is passive income really a thing? Are there actual instances of passive income? I think, yes, where, where the money you're getting back exceeds the time, energy, money that you put into creating it. I think there is a, a point where that uh, equation flips. And that's a great place to be. But yeah, so those old cues are still generating income and they're giving giving you income. For example, just this week, I I pulled up some stats uh, for a question over on the community and I pulled up some stats on the queue that was uh, about five years old and it made me $20 last quarter. Yes, by this point, that queue is generating income without me having to put any new energy into that queue, into getting that queue, uh, finding that queue a home. Now, <laughs> the library, that's not passive income for them because they're the ones pitching the queue. They're the ones doing all this is why they get their publishing share. <laughs> this is what, what I pay them to do. And by paying them, I mean cutting them into my royalties by giving them publishing share because it sure as heck isn't passive for them. But that same library still wants more from me. They still require an active role for me to participate in their library. And I know that's true because I've actually been kicked out of a library because I wasn't active enough. I went three or four years without submitting something and they were just pruning, you know, their, their composer list and I didn't make the cut and can't really blame them to be honest, because I wasn't, I wasn't actively supporting their business. But the real danger, the real danger of the active, or I'm sorry, the passive income mindset is this, I only have to build it once and then I can just kind of roll in the money. And I think that's where some courses, some books, I think this is where it's a little disingenuous, uh, to be honest. This is how I feel. And, and I'd love to know what you think. And I know that, uh, that we've got some, some folks from some other communities who watch the channel. Hello. And uh, please know, I'm not like looking to call any one person or any out specifically, because I know that those people who run courses and everything, I know that they take an active role. But I'm talking about the the YouTubers, the the get quick rich kind of, you know, make tons of money off of your music passively. And again, this four hour work week idea, I think is is super misguided. And it, it's a good book. It's an inspiring book, you know. But the idea that you can just 
write a bunch of stuff and it all works for you. I think it works for maybe a handful of people, but for the rest of us muggles, uh, we, we've got to uh, we've got to keep an active an active role in how we make music or how we make money making music. And if you think that it's just putting a bunch of stuff out there and waiting for the, the for the royalty checks to show up, I think you're going to end up very 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 disappointed. But I, I would love to hear from you. What do you think? Have you had success with passive income? And what's your take on passive versus active income? I'd love to hear from you. Let me know in the comments below. I do read all of the comments and I make an effort to reply to them if possible. And uh, and I would love to hear from you. So we're going to take a quick break. Uh, and then when we come back, uh, I am sitting down with Scott McLaughlin. We're going to be talking about his Q 25th hour, which was the winner of the May 2022 production derby over at 52 Qs. So you don't want to miss that. Uh, And we'll talk about it on the other side of the break. Hey, y'all, I'm Shannon Croft, and I want to tell you that the 52 Qs podcast is made possible by viewers and listeners just like you, composers and producers who are looking for a better way to connect and collaborate. You see, 52 Qs isn't just another website selling static, pre-recorded videos to a mass audience. It's a fun, vibrant, and positive community that comes together online for sharing cues, getting feedback, and discussing what's up in the production music industry. You'll find both personalized feedback and live interaction, which are the best and fastest ways to grow your skills and earn more placements. The best part is that the 52 Qs community is absolutely free. And when you're ready to take your career to the next level, we offer friends and family subscriptions, which unlock weekly live streams, live interactive group feedback sessions, monthly interactive workshops, and more. Head over to 52Qs.com and sign up today. And while you're there, check out our personalized feedback videos, private lessons, and of course, merch. I can't wait to see you at 52Qs.com. I got to tell you, this is absolutely amazing, and I I am so thrilled to be joined by the composer, the composer of that cue, twenty uh, fifth hour, uh, Scott McLaughlin. Welcome so much to the podcast, my friend. How are you doing? Thank you, Doctor Dave. I'm lucky <laughs> and honored to be here. Oh, uh, Doctor, not not quite yet, uh, uh, <laughs> Master Dave, I guess. But uh, Master I thought Dave. About- I've thought about my uh, my getting my doctorate, uh, but just add just throw it on the pile of of life goals. Yes. Yes. But uh, for for our listeners, that cue called Twenty Fifth Hour was composed by Mister McLaughlin and was a, an an entry into our production music. 
Derby, which is uh, essentially a series of challenges that we've got uh, rolling in the community. And we've got lots more, lots more in store for all of this. And But this was the first one for May of 2022. And the challenge was, write a tension cue using uh, recorded sounds from the kitchen. And, and Scott took that to the absolute maximum. And because the understanding was you could write basically anything you want as long as there is uh, one element, you know, from the kitchen. But Scott, mm-hmm. am I correct that every sound that we just heard was a sample recorded in the kitchen? Got, yes, got sir. the bolt, the whisk, the bowl to prove it. Oh, my. And I so so tell me. <laughs> it was that was a lazy Susan, right? Yeah. Hey, good. Yes. Who 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 thinks of of turning over a lazy Susan and sampling that? Well, obviously, you do. So tell tell us a little bit about the process um, from uh, from like reading about the Derby and and Ooh. some of your recording techniques and some of the sounds that we just heard. Okay. Well, first of all, I read the brief from 52 Qs, and I was excited, signed up for the Derby. And uh, so then um, I decided, well, if we're going to cross the bridge into making modern-day music concrete, um, you know, by sampling (laughs) sounds, uh, I'm just going to go to the kitchen. And uh, I said, how can I do this? So I just picked up some items and I'm a very good uh, and very. Oh, yeah. LaCroix ambassador there. (laughs) And so this became the atmosphere. Um, This little thing, which sounds like what it sounds like here, became the sub boom. And and, and what is that? Just describe describe, uh, what what you have there for any folks who might be listening to the podcast. This is a plastic container that we actually keep the brown sugar for coffee in the kitchen. And so um, through Valhalla Room, through uh, BX Subsynth, through um, pitch shifting in logic and EQ shaping, it became a sub boom. Wow. Wow, because there's nothing inherently subby about that sound. <laughs> no, no, not at all. And so you, you mentioned the uh, LaCroix can. Can you, sh- yes. can you show us that again and describe kind of what you were doing there? We were taking a can and kind of grinding it onto another surface. Is that what was happening there? Yeah, so basically, as you know, with audio manipulation, you can um, – take just about any sound and morph it into something. So the raw sound on the Audio-Technica microphone without the RX cleanup. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just sort of this. Which doesn't really sound like much. Right. And that's yeah. just a like a baking pan that you've got there? The, like a, yeah, this is a, a bread pan. Yep, yep. I, yeah, I make my own... Uh, I make my own banana bread, so I, I yeah, know Yeah, I was <laughs> just thinking about that. Uh, I haven't had breakfast yet. All right, so anyway, so it was that. And then what I did for that was I decided to drench it in reverb and mm-hmm. lower the pitch. And then I took just part of the wave file, looped it. Then I put it through the EQ and I went to latch mode in logic and I just sort of played with the, I guess, EQ sweep, the filter sweep. I'm not sure what you would call that. Yeah. So you just grabbed the node and started moving it around, basically recording the automation. Exactly. Exactly. Programming the automation. And then um, that sort of became a combination of a pulse or a tick and the atmosphere. And then, now, go ahead. Well, some of the other sounds, you know, the, the traditional transitional elements of, of risers. Uh, I took a wine glass, which actually became the melody, mm-hmm. but then also it served a multi purposes. I put it through alchemy 
and logic. Right. And, you know, as you know, how easy that is, you just place a sample in there and then you can play it like a keyboard. Yeah. So um, for one of the risers, I think, I can't remember, but it, it was maybe something like this. And then I detuned it, reversed it, had a lot of reverb, created a crescendo into, you know, bar one or wherever it was going to be. And uh, that became the transitional riser. Wow. Absolutely. Absolutely amazing. So uh, tell me again, you mentioned, uh, you know, Valhalla and some of the other, uh, but were, were you essentially using as far as the sample engine was that just stock logic like alchemy and, and those types of sample instrument or did you bring in anything into contact or anything anything fancy like that i wish i could say i did but no. <laughs> uh i would love to be able to you know develop an instrument in contact but um and I know it's it's just a learning curve away, but uh, no, I, mean, I, I got to tell do. you, I don't know, man. What what you have here <laughs> is is stellar, and, and I mean, you and now, now we voted on this. It wasn't just like me or Shannon saying this is the best, but um, we uh, we voted amongst the Derby participants, and there were 10, mm -hmm. 10, 10 entries, and so we, the Derby uh, members all voted, and it came down to a tie. <laughs> it was a tie. Mm -hmm. And so we then uh, put the voting out to the greater community and you won. Your, your track uh, won the 25th hour and that was voted by not only the Derby participants, but the entirety of the 52 Qs community. And so obviously, congratulations. And I think, I mean, it's no, it's no wonder why your Q won because, uh, and, and this isn't taking away from any of the other entries because we had some absolutely oh, stellar stellar incredible. entries really it's like it's like a master class in, in it really was so yeah. fascinating uh you know one person you know sampled uh like their their microwave and yes. then treated that yeah. and used it as kind of a bing button tone mm -hmm. another person mm -hmm. uh, sampled baloney you know yes. <laughs> like just, onto the town of, just yeah. never know yeah. so so uh so smart and like um knife whips and all this kind of stuff yes oh i love that but yeah. but i think what really elevated your cue and why it's no surprise that your cue uh, came out on top is because every sound, not and not just like every sound from the kitchen and kind of put together like a mosaic, mm -hmm. your cue sounds like a tension cue. It sounds like something you would absolutely hear in, in a TV show and knowing that each of these sounds you recorded uh, yourself. And, uh, and I'm assuming, you know, you mentioned your Audio Technica. Uh, I mean, that's tell us about kind of your, your microphone setups. I'm assuming you're not rolling in there with a $3,000 Neumann U87 or no, anything like that, no. as awesome as that would be. But uh, I'm assuming, you know, you're probably doing it guerrilla style. Exactly. And actually, as per the school of Dave, <laughs> um, I have recently purchased, not for this, but your inspiration, the the Samson CO2s. The Samson CO2s, man. Yes. So they came in the mail. I have yet to use them, but I'm really excited about getting uh, the same setup that you have. Yeah, the um, Samson CO2s are like a hundred bucks, or they might be a little bit more now. But uh, but yeah, I got like mine. One thirty. Yeah, for the pair, and it comes with a, a, a mount and a shock. Uh, like, uh, well, it comes with uh, the mic clips, which are shock mounts, and all of that. So, uh, so yeah, I, I love those. But mainly, the main mic I used was. Uh, let me get it here. Yeah. See, you don't have to have like super fancy microphones. <laughs> they help. That having nice mics doesn't hurt. But uh, but so much you can overcome with good EQing and with cleanup. Is that the uh, the 2020? Yes. Yep. The AT 2020, mm -hmm. which is a which was my first uh, before I got my Samsons. Uh, that was my first kind of large diaphragm microphone, and uh, I think they're stellar microphones. So I've yeah. done quite a bit of you know adding to cues with that um but one thing that i'm wanting to get into more and 
you have opened my eyes to that is I do have I do have RX, but uh, now I need to learn how to use it. So yeah, and RX is the uh, from Isotope. It's the audio cleanup yes. app. And that, mm. yeah, I did a uh, I did a test when I had my friends, you know, vintage Neumanns, and yes. I A B'd like Neumanns out of the box, and my hundred dollar Samsons. Uh, CO2s cleaned up an RX mm -hmm. and the Neumann sounded better. I'm not going to say they didn't, but with a little bit of cleanup, you can absolutely close that gap between. But you if know. you think exponentially the money, mm -hmm. that's uh, yeah, a great yeah. value. A absolutely. So walk us through a little bit about the um, the form and the structure of, of your Q25th uh, 25th hour as you were, you know, once you got all the pieces together, that's one thing, mm -hmm. but you can't just kind of put it all in just and stack them and layer them. I mean, there has to be, you know, conscious, creative decisions behind creating a tension Q. And, and your Q absolutely has all of this together because it sounds like a, like a, and I don't mean this pejoratively. It sounds like your garden variety tension cue that could show up on any number of crime shows, uh, meaning that that's absolutely usable by library. So, so walk us through a little bit about your form and structure and compositional thinking behind it. Okay, so first of all, I have a love for you know investigative tension, crime drama, all of that, the cues that go with that, and that is mostly what I've been focusing on lately for libraries. Uh, so I basically use the artisan approach, as mm -hmm. per Dave, <laughs> and uh, I, you know, just use some of the same elements that I would have written for any other tension cue, meaning minor to tonality, um, use of the tritone, maybe, um, you know, flat six, whatever, just um, tones that are outside of the augmented intervals, things like mm -hmm. that. <clears throat> as far as the form, um, I think I had two or maybe even three, probably just two edit points for a music editor, um, stated the melody and sort of a call and response melody that was stated numerous times, um, started out by quoting the melody at the beginning, then uh, in four bar phrases, continuing with that and um, bringing in the transitional risers. Um, I didn't bring any whooshes in, but um, uh, used all of that and sort of like the the structure or the concept of, I guess, the garden variety tension cube. Yeah. Then again, I don't mean that like as anything <laughs> no, I bad. Know what you, I know exactly that at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, you've got to, you know, you got to throw strikes if you if you want if you yes. want the uh, the editor to to hit it out of the park. You got to give them strikes across the home plate there. And this absolutely, this absolutely did. Well, Scott, man, thank you. First of all, thank you for your support. Thanks for jumping into the derby and for uh, all you know all the all the kind words about what we do here at Fifty Two Qs. I mean, because it truly is folks like you who uh, who help lift the community. It's not just like the Dave Show. It's you know together we are better. And mm -hmm. so um, I really really appreciate you and again congratulations on a stellar cue and uh hey you should probably you should create a whole album of these kind of things just you know you know that in the fun. kitchen sink yeah yes. because i think it, it really goes to show and you've proved that a you don't have to have like crazy fancy expensive gear or you don't have to have amazing plugins you know from you know fab mm -hmm. filter and nothing against them i have fab filter plugins but using just your t the tools that you have and uh, a spark of creativity, and then knowing how these kind of cues are put together, I man, I think you've proven that that you don't have to have all these million dollar uh, million dollars of gear. You just have to have really good ideas and a creative spark. And I think you've proven that, man. Well done. Well, thank you so much. Well I done. just wanted to say that I really appreciate all that you and Shannon do for the community and. Um, Part of my morning ritual is listening to you putting together cues, and I uh, love the transparency mm. of the uh, serenading with the ukulele and <laughs> many other things that you add to the process. So. Well, I, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. And what I'd love to do is now that we've talked about the different sounds, uh, we're going we're gonna to take us, take us out by listening to 25th Hour one more time. And now that you know what sounds 
you're listening for, or now you know what sounds are coming from, I want you to try to see if you can spot them all. But Scott, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Once again, I have to thank Scott McLaughlin, not just for joining me up here on the 52 Q's podcast, but also for for participating in our first ever production derby. And uh, believe me, we have much more planned for this. And uh, we've got a lot of ideas. So you want to be sure to stay tuned. Um, But ultimately, you know, the cornerstone of 52 Q's is the feedback community. Posting your cues, leaving feedback for others, receiving feedback from others, all on our different journeys in our production music careers from seasoned pros with hundreds and hundreds of credits to folks brand new and just learning the ropes. Everybody is absolutely welcome at 52 Cues, and we would love to have you uh, to join. is free, and uh, and yeah, you can if you're ready to to move on to take your kind of career and your skills to the next level. We have programs and subscriptions and everything uh, available for you, and uh, we hope you do. We hope you do join us over at 52Cues.com, and then finally. Once again, I have to give a special word of thanks to our family, friends, and patrons who help keep the lights on, help keep the internet happening as far as paying hosting and all of that. We are 100% community supported. Uh, we don't have any, you know, you are not going to hear any Hello Fresh ads or anything like that. Uh, we are supported by you. So thank you. Thank you so very much. Please know that I appreciate and love every single one of you. Now, that's going to do it for us for this week, but you don't want to miss next week where I sit down and chat with uh, someone who's become a really good friend over a relatively short period of time, Eric Copeland of Make Music Income and the Make Music Income podcast that he co-hosts with Stephen Bedall of the Production Music Academy. Eric joins me and we talk about stock music. We talk about what this career, you know, looks like in the modern day. And uh, it's a, we, we laugh a lot. We chat a lot. Uh, we're actually here in Central Florida together and we have since had lunch together. And so uh, I'm really, really excited to finally be able to share with you my chat with Eric Copeland of Make Music Income. But that's going to do it for me today. Once again, thank you for all of your support. Thank you for watching. And uh, and yeah, I hope you had a great week and I can't wait to talk to you next time. Until then, peace. The 52 Q's podcast is copyright 2022, Dave Croft, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the 52 Q's community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52Q's.com.